after the First World War ended, there was one country in Europe that might very well qualify as the center of aviation. It might surprise you, actually. It wasn't Britain, Italy, or a clandestine Germany, but France. With passion and experience, the French were both the spiritual soul and the beating heart of all things flying. But then, in 1940, things changed, as the Germans put a sudden stop to what had become a vibrant but chronically disorganized and underfunded community. Over the next five years, France would see no more aeronautical development and completely missed the shift from the piston to the jet engine. Under normal conditions, such a drastic collapse of industry, know-how and experience would have been completely disastrous, catapulting the country back many decades. But this is France we are talking about and where there is passion, there is possibility. Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History and this episode is ad-free, sponsored by my Patreons. If you like what you see today, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon or PayPal as this helps me travel to museums, sort out the logistics and get this sort of content into your living room. Today we are at Klandel in Bayern, Switzerland, looking at a surprising shooting star. The Dassault Mirage 3, a French jet fighter from the Cold War era. A plane that is from an unlikely origin and one that could jostle with the very best ones out there. Coming into the 1950s, the Cold War was in full swing. The Korean War had been a rude wake-up call for all whom had missed the signs of the Berlin airlift. Thus, while Europe had just come out of a cataclysmic conflict, World War II, many wondered whether worse was not to come. Although France had a thriving aeronautical community in the interwar years, all French development when it came to aircraft stopped abruptly in 1940 when the Wehrmacht came knocking down the rear door, reducing the once proud industry into a subsidiary for Luftwaffe production, where once they had produced a mighty air fleet, they were now building trainer and liaison aircraft for the Germans. Post-war, the French Air Force was reliant on British and American planes. For the French government, this, this was unthinkable. Prestige be damned, there was a practical reason for this. Self-reliance was critical when it came to defense policy. So France went through a rapid reconstruction of its once great aviation industry hoping to not repeat the uh, mistake from the interwar years when many promising projects were not given proper funding and attention, France funded a large series of prototypes in the hopes of making up for the lost time. At the same time, it went shopping, turning, for example, to the British Vampire to import jet fighters, both to field a modern air force and to acquire working equipment that they themselves could learn from. France went through an unparalleled aviation revolution, finding inspiration from existing designs and adapting their own. Out of this drive came planes like the 1950s Saberesque Dassault Ourangon, the vampire's uh, French cousin, the Mistral, or the Mystère. Marcel Bloch, who the Germans had deported, also returned to France and founded a new firm. It was this company that would be in 1953 taking a courageous step, 
having experimented with many different designs from prototypes to frontline aircraft heavily inspired by foreign designs, that so felt, well, that they were ready to build what would be France's return to the big league. The government itself was looking for a light Mach 2 capable supersonic all-weather fighter. One with a rapid paper to production potential. For the prototype Dassault used two British Armstrong Sidley jet engines and it, as well as the rivaling Sudest, opted to go with the unorthodox Delta Wing. The MD-550, or Mystère Delta as it was known, uh, first flew in June 1955. The name was rapidly changed to show that it was something new, forward-thinking, and had uh, no relation to the existing Mystère design. Thus, the Mirage was born. The Mirage 1 was a disappointment at first. Not only had Dassault taken the specifications of a light fighter a bit too serious by building a machine that was considered, well, small and ex essentially too light. Uh, it could also only reach Mach 1.15 by going into a shallow dive and modifications followed. Thus the Mirage 1 was but a proof of concept and the Mirage 2 was slotted to be next. Meant to feature two Turbomeca Gaviso turbojets, jointly close to 5,000 pounds of thrust without reheat, and a pair of rocket boosters, projection saw it loitering at about Mach 1.55. That still wasn't good enough. So the Mirage 2 was completely dropped. A new engine was needed, and Dassault found it in the Attar, based on a German BMW turbojet. With a thrust of close to 10,000 pounds, the engine was exactly what was needed and used with a backup rocket boost. The necessary speed and reach and ceiling was to be found. The Delta Wing design was also gaining traction abroad at this time and by looking at some of the international developments and playing around with their own design a bit more, Dassault was finally able to present their next generation fighter. The Mirage 3. Speed still proved to be a little bit of an issue for the aircraft. The so just couldn't go beyond Mach 1.6 and that was in a 20 degrees dive. A stronger engine was still needed and added and also the air intake was changed with the introduction of this half cone that you see right here. This moved uh, dependent on speed and allowed for an optimal air flow. While the aircraft wasn't ready just yet, it proved itself to be a promising enough start for the French government to order 10 pre-production versions. The wing was again modified a little bit further, greater surface area was added and a lower thickness to short ratio was maintained. And the engine was operated once again. Extra rocket boosts were added and the fuselage was lengthened as well. The first of the new versions appeared in 58 and 59. Mach 2.0 was finally reached and uh, with the new radar and fire control system were added, trials showed that the Mirage was both a capable interceptor and a reliable ground attacker. By now the Mirage 3 had been in development for about four years. With successful trials completed, uh, 100 Mirage 3 Cs were ordered in 1960. Dassault, a relatively small firm considering all things, was forced to upscale significantly, which it did successfully. Uh, nevertheless, of all the roughly 1,400 Mirages built, only about 14% were actually constructed by the parent company, even after its merger with Breguet. Uh, the aircraft was introduced into the French Air Force the following year, 1961. The two-seat uh, B model paralleled this development. Uh, the E model followed only a short while later, bringing some tactical nuclear strike potential and became a matured production version, while the R was a recon variant. As part of the French Republic, the Mirage 3 served in multiple conflicts, but was also a success on the export market, providing an alternative to the growing monopoly of the American industry in the West. Turning to the aircraft behind me, you will obviously have noticed the white on red cross, the Swiss markings. Switzerland was one of those countries that decided to integrate the Mirage 3 
into their air force, which it did alongside countries such as uh, Australia, Belgium, Israel, Pakistan and Spain. An early 1961 license order for one-handed aircraft was cut to 57 by 1964 due to cost cutting, uh, although the cancellation fees actually voided the potential savings. Uh, but the introduction commenced in 67. The Mirage 3S was based on the 3E, but it had one important change. Instead of adopting the French radar and fire control system, Switzerland decided to once again modify the aircraft by adding the American Taran 18 system for the use of AM4 Falcon air-to-air -air missiles as well as the AM9 Sidewinders. Honestly, the system, well, in the Mirage, it was essentially a marriage in hell and it never really worked properly as far as I can tell. So the least said about it, the better. Switzerland also acquired the DS, a trainer version, and the RS, a recon aircraft. Switzerland actually kept some of their Mirages in service until 2003 and had actually built an interesting bunker system for their deployment. You essentially had a runway right next to a mountain and a crane would lift the aircraft out of the protected caverns onto the airstrip, turn the aircraft 90 degrees and there it would just conduct a J2 takeoff and go into the sky. And once it returns, it is then taken up and folded back into the protection of the country's great mountain ranges. You know, you, you gotta love the Swiss. The Mirage 3 has a length of 15.3 meters, a span of 8.2, and it stands at 4.5 meters. It is powered by a single Atar 09C3, which gives it a maximum drive thrust of 7,300 pounds, and it also has a separate rocket boost. The aircraft has a normal ceiling of 18,000 meters and has an extended option via the rocket boost to 20. 3,000 meters. It can achieve a top speed of around 2,160 kilometers per hour and has a range of 1,200 kilometers. Empty, it weighs around 6.7 tons with a maximum takeoff weight of 13.7 tons. The plane comes equipped with two internal 30 millimeter DEFA 552 cannons holding roughly 125 rounds each. Additional pylons are of course available for missiles, rockets, bombs and drop tanks. Before jumping into the cockpit, let's have a closer look at some of the aircraft's special features. The cannons, for example, in the Mirage 3 come in a removable pod. This is similar to how it was done in the Hawker Hunter and other aircraft, and of course this also had a couple of advantages. On the one hand, turnaround time could theoretically be decreased, although you know, this, this also depends on refueling times and other factors. It did, however, give easier access to the guns for maintenance and made restocking the ammo easier. The pod held the ammunition of both 30mm cannons between the guns. Looking at the small metal guide plaque, you can see how they were supposed to be folded into each box. Once fitted into its spot, the pod fits perfectly into the aircraft and you wouldn't be able to tell from the outside that a removable pod is housed below the fuselage. Another advantage of this was that, just like you can see on this figure from a manual, the French manual in this case, a small additional fuel tank could be added instead of cannons. As for the different weapon systems, you can see a collection of weapon and mounting spots here based on the French and not the Swiss layout and equipment. By the way, if you are interested in this manual, I will be sharing it on my Patreon page where you can have a look at it. As you can expect, the aircraft also features some air brakes. These are a bit special, consisting of multiple smaller brakes rather than the more common one or two large brakes of the time. They sit on the upper wing and lower wing, opening as indicated in the small figure from the manual. Then we come to this long and thin contraption. This is the integrated rocket boost tank holding 300 liters. It sits in a centerline position below the engine ending near a slightly downward deflected nozzle. This then is the separate rocket boost meant to increase the operating ceiling of the aircraft. This whole rocket boost could be removed to have a simple fuel tank for the main ATAR engine. For J2 takeoff, that's jet assisted takeoff, additional rocket boosts could be mounted below the wing here in a four rocket layout on either side. This was an integral part of the Swiss doctrine meant to get these aircraft into the sky fast and on a very short field. By the way, this picture of a Mirage doing a JATO takeoff was apparently taken in 1996 here at the museum's location in Payern 
and the museum right now is still next to an active Swiss military airfield. So if you visit it in the future and you suddenly hear that rumbling of a jet engine, you should run upstairs to their viewing platform and with some luck, you'll see some Swiss FA-18s taking off. Anyway, back to the Mirage. Next to the already mentioned avionics modifications, which required a larger nose, the requirements for JATO takeoff meant that Swiss aircraft had strengthened wings, a new stronger undercarriage, and also mounting points for a crane. One of the most prominent visual features of the Swiss aircraft, however, remain the canards mounted on top of the engine air intakes. This feature is on all Swiss Mirage aircraft and was added in 1988 with the last upgrade package by RUAG Switzerland. Talking about the recon aircraft, let's have a closer look at the camera setup. It is set in the nose and folds outwards. You can have a really good look at this in the museum. And you can see how the hinge door has multiple windows for the lenses and light entry, as well, of course, as the lens and the camera itself. On the side, you can also see what I assume to be aperture settings for the different altitudes and situations. And with that said, let's jump into the cockpit. In the cockpit, we start as always on the left. Because this aircraft was kept in service for a long time and heavily modified, this being Switzerland after all, it is somewhat different to the Mirage 3s you will find in France or for example also down under in Australia. The first prominent feature you see on the left is the control stick for the radar. It sits in front of the fuel system and afterburner cock. This is somewhat different to the typical Mirage 3 radar control stick as it is now linked to Taran 18 and not Cyrano. Pushing the stick left or right changes the azimuth plus minus 52 degrees. Forward and backwards movements change the range gate if the radar trigger is pressed at least in the first position. In the first position the radar is in narrow scan mode plus minus 10 degrees and remains so even if the pilot changes the azimuth. One more press into position 2 and the radar will try to lock on. Let's go through the remaining button and switches. On top of the stick is for the measurement of the forward and rear echo pulse. It is pressed forward, long, if the pilot engages tail on, flip backwards to court for head on. The wheel to the side allows the radar evaluation to change, plus minus 45 degrees, while the prominent red button is to change the emitter frequency. From what I can gather, the pilot would go through the following manual sequence during an attack. First, he presses and keeps the radar trigger in position two. By doing so, he will already be in narrow scan mode and the system will try to identify a single target. Then he changes the azimuth, the elevation and the range gate onto the target by moving the stick and thumbnail. When the radar achieves a lock, he lets go of the trigger. He then selects long or court depending on the required echopulse measurement. He now receives information on required heading and lead, allowing him to engage the target. Moving away then from the radar control stick, the handle in front of it is your engine control with an air brake control switch. It has two functions, either allowing short braking bursts, which open and closes the air brakes based on pilot inputs, or opens and locks them until they are retracted manually again. Out of view are the transmit, side override and cage buttons. On the throttle, you can go into afterburner by pushing beyond the full dry stop. Above the throttle, you will find the drag chute release. And beside the throttle control, the control switches for the JATO rockets with the ignition switch secured under a yellow black safety catch. Moving on beyond the throttle, the communication panels and the navigation, formation and landing lights. The left panel has the undercarriage lever, the control and stabilizer dampeners and the shock cone switch. Although automated above Mach 1.25, the pilot can use this switch to manually adjust the air inlet in case of a malfunction. Now here it also is going to get complicated. You'll see various buttons all labeled with a different letter. I'll identify them here phonetically just for the purpose of making it easier. The first row are the controls for the hydraulic flight dampeners, Tango for the elevation and Lima for the yaw dampener. Below that are the controls for the autopilot system, although this is not a complete autopilot system but more of an assist. 
uh, pressing PAPA activates the system, resulting in the plane following the pilot's current control input, thus preventing it to reset to neutral. Then if you press HOTEL, this keeps the aircraft on the current altitude. This altitude hold system does not work between Mach 0.95 and 1.15. And it can also be reset by a simple push or pull input on the stick. Romeo then is for the course hold system. This must be pressed in to prep the system. Then on the control stick, the pilot presses the course hold switch and the system engages. A warning light indicates that the system is not working or not engaged. Starting on the front instrument panel from top left, the gyroscopic attitude indicator, a standby artificial horizon, your speedometer in kilometers per hour with an integrated Mach counter. Below this, your vertical speed indicator and altimeter. The smaller gauge below it shows the shock cone position. On top, the optical side with a weapon-specific reticle control and a luminosity switch. Above to the right, the G-meter and an angle of attack indicator is to the left. To the top left, a clock and on the opposite side, your whiskey compass. Below the side, we come to the radar and navigational screen. Remember, of course, that the Mirage 3 in Swiss service has the Taran 18 installed, which makes this a configuration that is unique. The upper screen is the radar, the lower is for the navigational display, called NAPRO. A radar warning receiver sits to the top right. The antennas can be found on the wingtips and above the rudder. Then the engine temperature and RPM indicator, and a fuel gauge and a pressure indicator. Then on the right hand side, we come to a navigational control panel. On the top, from left to right, an adjustable wheel and indication of the distance to the chosen destination, and the same for wind speed and direction, as well as the destination's altitude. The middle row allows the pilot to track two different destinations, again, left to right. Adjustment wheels and indication for X and Y coordinates of destination A, and next to this, the same for destination B. These work in conjunction with the Swiss Air Force's navigational grid. And then the selector for destination A, B, C and D. I assume that four destinations can thus be saved into the system. And then two wheels to adjust the map manually in X and Y. Below this navigational control panel, you will also find the chaff and the flare dispenser control panel on the side. This system was also upgraded in 1988 by RUAC. A cockpit seal and ram air lever can also be found on this side, while the weapon control panel is found below the chaff and flare dispenser control panel further to the right, followed by the IFF, the temperature control and the circuit breakers. Then we move to the pilot's control stick. It features the following buttons. Top middle, the trim switch. To the right, under the safety catch, the missile and bomb release. Once the safety is uncaged, it also becomes a pull trigger. On the left, this is unique to Swiss Mirages, the weapon select switch. Pressed forward, the pilot selects the IR missile. Pulled backwards, he goes medieval and switches to guns in air-to-air -air mode. If pressed down, the selection resumes to the weapon chosen in the main weapon selector panel. Out of view then is the radio transmit button. Since 1988, the pilot also sat in a new Martin Baker ejection seat, substituting the older used models. As part of my visit to the Museum Clandel in Payerne, Switzerland, I filmed four Inside the Cockpit episodes that were fully sponsored by my Patreons and channel members who make these trips possible, so I want to specifically thank them here again. And as an additional thank you, I've linked flight manuals to all four of these planes on Patreon and the YouTube community tab for members, which you are free to download when you want. I also want to thank Clandel in Payerne for the amazing access they have given me. Once normal travel resumes, I would highly encourage you all to visit the museum. 
The aircraft are in absolute tip top perfect condition. It is well worth your time and the staff is extremely friendly. And I want to specifically thank Monsieur Pasteris and Herr Studer for their help during filming and especially in trying to figure out the unique Swiss Mirages cockpit. If you visit the museum, say hi from me. And also thank you to Elliot who was an invaluable help on this trip for both logistics and filming. I really hope that all of you have enjoyed these videos filmed at Clandel and I hope that you have a great day and see you in the sky.